So intellectually and morally, uh, people from the cognitive science, sciences have have turned everything we know about the Enlightenment, everything we know, even, even everything we know about medicine, upside down. First, do no harm. Now, now you get climate psychologists, uh, clinical psychologists, and psychiatrists saying we must go and upset people. You're listening to the Corbett Report. Welcome back, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, in a conversation that's coming to you uh, being recorded on the 8th of April, 2024. And although I am often the bearer of bad news and talking about depressing and horrible things that are going on in the world, it is one of my rare joys in life to be able to bring to my audience's attention, well, I won't say new writers, but at least new to the audience, potentially. And uh, today will be no exception to that. I'm going to be talking to Mr. Ben Pyle of the Net Zero Scandal Substack. He also has a a website, climatedebate.co.uk. He is a writer at The Daily Skeptic. And we're going to be talking about, well, a very specific article that he's written recently on a subject that I know intersects with with, um, subjects that are interesting in my world, and I'm sure to the uh, regular viewers of the Corbett Report audience, um, specifically his recent article at The Daily Skeptic, behavioral scientists aren't just wrong about how to win over electorates to crackpot progressive policies. Their evident contempt for the masses has contributed to the global populist revolt, which is quite a a mouthful, but quite a good description of that article. Um, On that note, as I say, I have only recently discovered um, Ben Pyle and his writings, but I will definitely direct people uh, towards some of them that I I find fascinating and that could be the subject of conversations in and of themselves. For example, a recent article on the rash of Carney, talking about the former Bank of England and Bank of Canada governor, um, who is now apparently advising the Labour Party on climate um, policy. Also, a very interesting article on the unofficial official ideology of British institutions, which goes some way towards uh, very factually laying out and eviscerating the ideological narrative being portrayed um, by the uh, the BBC and the Royal Society about capitalism and environmentalism. Also, an excellent 20-minute compendium video called Why There Is No Climate Crisis, which um, it contains a lot of inconvenient facts that the Extinction Rebellion crowd would probably rather you not know about. So I will, of course, link up all of those in the show notes. But here to talk about his uh, most recent article, let, let's bring on Ben Pyle. Ben, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here and, and to meet you at last. Yes, excellent. Well, as as is my want, uh, since you're the first, uh, this is your first time on the Corbett Report. Why don't you introduce yourself to us? Who are you? Where do you come from? Why are you writing about these subjects? Oh yeah, so thanks very much. That's a huge question, and um, I should point out first, I didn't, I didn't write that title. I wrote the article. I didn't write the title of that that really long, uh, long, long piece. Actually, it's probably uh, 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 getting on for for probably the longest title of anything I've ever <laughs> ever done. And um, uh, I used to get uh, accused of writing uh, eight hundred words where eighty would do, and uh, so that's that that sort of effort. Um, I guess started about 20, uh, maybe 17 years ago in the late 2000s. And we were, uh, I and a, a writing partner, we picked up some problems with the climate narrative, so to speak, um, as as it was sort of uh, then. And, and we decided we, we'd sort of capitalize on that. We didn't, we'd, we'd, we'd invest our time in that and write about these problems that we perceived. And, and that was the, the climate change had sort of almost descended to science in or to to climate science in particular and um and we thought there was a lot more to be said about what the ideology of environmentalism was and the extent to which that had been established in uh, the the academy i suppose and 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 politics without this sort of attention that would have normally been drawn by ideological movements um in their ascendancy to you know to to occupy as as it as it is um uh, the case in, in Britain, um, uh, the the corridors of power. That Brit- Britain's, I, I, I take the view um, uh, uh, that environmentalism is an ism like any other ism, the isms that characterised the early to mid 20th century, and that they're seeking a, a, a pretty pretty radical, uh, far-reaching transformation of society. So. 
notwithstanding the science, we, we should we should take it at at, at, at in, on that basis. We should take it at a face value. They want they're clear about it. They say it. They want to change society. And so, so we say, okay, well, what kind of world do you want? And how do you want to go about changing that world? And um, and of course, part of that uh, program, if you like, part of that agenda involves recruiting the likes of climate psychologists, psychologists intervening in the uh, in in the climate debate in very much the way I'm I would argue, or I maybe mean, maybe it's ameliorated somewhat um that uh, 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 very much following the role that psychologists had in the soviet union if i can put it that strongly and perhaps other um uh, uh, tyrannies so so you, you know the the, the the a lot of a lot of people were using science at the time climate science um as a club to beat people around the head and and sort of require their obedience and their submission um, and, and to exclude them from debates. And, and, and that in itself, whether or not CO2 is a greenhouse gas and whether greenhouse gases are causing global warming and whether or not global warming is causing climate change, that needs to be interrogated. Um, and and, uh, and uh, a lot of people from within the academy and, 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 uh, and so-called civil society um, really are hostile to the, the, to the principle that ordinary people with or without expertise um and people who are not part of um you know the ivory towers of the academy they don't think that that such people should be able to influence political decisions um so that's you know that's that's where we started from and then that's rolled on um over the last 20 years um most people have um, you know probably ignored my efforts um the the net zero is in full swing here i can't claim to have um changed the debate uh, yet but um that's because most people haven't yet had to experience what net zero really means for them um as you know as i put it no pain no campaign um, it wasn't until recently that people really felt the effects of of, of high prices, um, and and so so things are changing now. The, the the mood of the debate has radically changed in the in the last few years. So and that and that's created opportunities to do more stuff. Working for been writing for Spike for most of the duration, and and now writing for Daily Skeptic and um, producing more videos and criticisms of the agenda. Well, you, you raise there, I think, two of the important intertwined aspects of what we're talking about today. One is the the, the haughty elitist attitude of the, the would-be rulers of society and directors of society, the social engineers who wish to manipulate the masses and how out of touch they really are, but also the growing backlash to that that is forming now that the net zero um, campaign is really starting to um, impinge on people's everyday lives. So in order to to set the table for this conversation, to get a handle on this article, I, I was thinking, what is the best way to introduce this to the audience? And it struck me, why not start at the beginning? So with that amazing brainstorm out of the way, I, I, let me just read the opening paragraph to this article, because I think it sets the table in a good way. Um, Nothing strikes as much fear through the establishment's fact checkers and hate vanquishers as the rise of populism. Democratic backlashes against dominant ideologies and policy agendas are the natural and inevitable reaction to the intransigence of those who advance them. These reactions, which look likely to sweep many populist parties to power in elections this year, are seen by incumbents as the reemergence of dark historical forces. But our leaders have no other words for the challenges to their authority than far right. The reason they cannot grasp what's really going on, indeed one of the causes of their unpopularity, is that they've placed too much faith in what has turned out to be really bad science. And it strikes me that there are perhaps two candidates for that really bad science <laughs> that are <laughs> that they've misplaced their faith in. Um, but why don't you lay it out mm -hmm. for us? What, what bad uh, science are you referring to there? Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the co cognitive and behavioural sciences, like the, this, the, uh, the, this, this uh, 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 idea that you can understand people's psychology and then intervene to elicit their obedience, and nudge, essentially, you know, um, at, at its at its at the most basic level, nudge, right? Um, and and then nudge comes to shove. 
you know, like the, like there's, there's there's nothing as frustrated as someone who thought that they could, um, you know, convince you, and they they march into a debate thinking that they're going to come out of the out of the room having convinced you to surrender all your belongings and so on and so forth, and and, and going away empty-handed. Um, but this seems to be the the pattern of um, psychology's uh, relationship with the government in Britain. Um, you, you know, it's very successful, perhaps, at, 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 at convincing politicians that that they have this uh, software or, or this technology um, that that can that can change the, the the mindsets of the of the masses. But it doesn't seem to capture many people's beliefs outside of those uh, that outside of that sphere. Um, the the you know the the the, the classic example which I refer to in the. Um, in the article, the, the the sort of go-to demonstration of the success of nudge is that if you paint a little fly in the corner of the urinal, or not necessarily not the corner, because you want you want people to be accurate, then they take more care not to spill anything on the floor, right? But it turns out, who knew? Uh, the, the policy making and politics, uh, which involves the balancing of myriad different interests and constituencies, is a little bit more complicated than peeing. And, uh, and, and, and so, so these insights, um, which nudges offer, may have some application in some extremely sort of prosaic, li- limited, uh, limited uh, spheres of activity, but, but they're, they're, they've told um, government that they can they can transform the the public's perception at large, right? You know of, of these things in order to in order for them to accept uh, these radical um, anti democratic um, uh, p- policy in, in interventions. Um, so so it just it looks like snake oil and it smells like snake oil and all the people who peddle it smell smell like uh, <laughs> look like snake oil merchants. So I I, I um so I, I came with that kind of position of, of skepticism of this because it's very tempting to believe that there are these sophisticated techniques for con- for controlling people's minds and 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 what have you and and that leads to I think there was sort of something of a fait accompli settling in to the sort of sceptical or what you might call the freedom uh, movements um, that, that, that sort of emerged from from, from COVID and, and people really sort of thought, ah, they, they've really sort of advanced this stuff. But it isn't. When nudge comes to shove, shove um, it, it's just fear-mongering. And, and it's just panic, mon- you know, this is uh, Greta's line, I, I want you to panic, right? That is, and and that, that's not a coincidence, incidentally, that, that she said that the, the I want you to panic line comes out of uh, a clinical psychologist's um, attempts to um, mobilize the public. Margaret Klein Salomon is her name, and she she's the person credited with actually giving birth to uh, Greta Thunberg's school strike movement and the Extinction Rebellion. Um, so, so you know, as soon as as soon as um, uh, the, the the sort of the, the behavioural insights uh, 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 claims uh, dissolve because the, the, they're not equal to the task that they that they've uh, they've assumed, um, it's just fear mongering, panic mongering, and terror, um, and and uh, and and that's just you know it's just bog standard. Um, uh, what would you call it? Tyranny? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the word, 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 words for it are. I think, I, and and so so like kind of the the toolbox is empty. Very very quickly into their into the into sort of the the, the, the beginnings of their interventions, um, and 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 they're left exhausted. And so then what then what happens is climate psychology just seems to turn into self justification. It seems to so so like let, let's let's assume some experimental evidence. Um, finds that in certain laboratory uh, conditions, I say laboratory. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a climate uh, uh, psychologist with a with a, a questionnaire, and uh, and uh, and a respondent or you know a series of respondents. Um, they may say that there's there's sort of insight that that, that that discovers that people are one percent more likely to behave in a certain way if you present the consensus position to them, right? So and 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 that's that is the degree of um, confidence that climate psychology uh, kind of produces 
um, its claims. It's very, you know, very small effects. And then these, this, this, this one percent sort of uh, finding from from climate psychology seems sufficient then to justify quite radical policy intervention, such as uh, censorship, soft censorship, perhaps. You know, you, you, the British government is is very good, for example, at setting up these sort of quangos. They're called quasi autonomous non governmental organisations that sort of serve as regulate regulators of the public sphere with a sort of hands off approach from government, but they're censored sensors all the same and the government sensors or all, all, all the same um so so on the on the basis of these <clears throat> this kind of experimental evidence you get these sort of draconian interventions that sort of um seek to re that require broadcasters to 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 uh undertake um particular codes of conduct when they're kind of interviewing someone who um comes from the other side of the or the wrong side of, of a climate debate. It doesn't matter whether they're saying there's no such thing as uh, greenhouse gas or there's no such thing as climate change. It might just be saying wind turbines are a terrible idea. Um, you, 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 you get the same, you, you get the same treatment. Um, and that's had a material effect on the, the public discussion about, or certainly the, the discussion in the media in the UK and probably across Europe um, about climate policy, um, but based on just wafer thin um, uh, uh, pseudo scientific insight, um, and and I think that's producing. That's that's to institute a formal intransigence into the political sphere. So sort of like this this justifies not listening to climate skeptics. No, no, everything you say is wrong. There's there's no there's no place for you in the public debate. The debate is over. The science is settled. Um, uh, you go, go away, and um, that being the 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 kind of ethic now in the British establishment and across the European Union as well. Um, uh, th th there's no there's no there's no dialogue between those competing interests. People who want to Im implement this radical environmentalist agenda, and people who are going to lose out from that, farmers. Um, especially um, people who work in industries, the industries are, are, are going to be very sensitive to high energy prices. Um, they're not allowed into the debate, and 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 so naturally, now people are beginning to lose out. It's it's it, that intransigence has produced its own reaction. You know, you you raise a number of important points there. Um, one of which is that. I think these would-be social engineers really do believe that they're these master Machiavellian manipulators yeah. who are able to fine-tune public opinion with because they're they're masters of public psychology. But in reality, as you point out and as you reference here in the article, I mean, it's not only the replication crisis that has pervaded all of psychology and much of science besides, but psychological science in particular, but also the known political biases within the field of uh, social yeah. um, uh, social sciences um, ha have undermined what I think most people know is a lot of baloney and, and hoo-ha anyways. It, it always strikes me, these types of... Um, studies that are carefully designed where they, they come in and they, for example, they have someone who is uh, pro-death penalty and someone who is anti-death penalty and they, they separate these groups and then they give the pro-death penalty people facts and statistics and scientific study that shows that in fact, actually, it has no effect, the death penalty has no effect on crime rates and recidivism rates. And, and then they show the anti-death penalty people the exact opposite data and studies and whatever, and they're just making all of this up and they're giving it to each group. And then, uh, as it turns out, people don't just believe anything that a scientist researcher in this laboratory setting tells them. <laughs> it sh that shows that these people have confirmation bias. Whereas, to my mind, no, it shows that people aren't gullible rubes who fell off a turnip truck yesterday and can actually identify when they're in a laboratory setting being tested on that maybe they're being lied to. <laughs> you know, has that ever occurred to anyone who's set up one of these studies before? A a anyway, that, that type of nonsense leads to this nonsense science 
science in which people believe perhaps maybe the, the, the people who are really buying the idea that this is some sort of fine-tuned ma master manipulation of the public consciousness and they can nudge people in whatever direction they want. The only people who are really buying this are the politicians who, speaking of confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance, are the ones who want to believe that they can do this. And so it, it creates this sort of self-licking ice cream cone that <laughs> accomplishes nothing but makes these people feel very good about excluding uh, as you say, inconvenient people from this conversation, which obviously, as you point out in this article, obviously leads to the political backlash that we are seeing right now um, in a way that's so obvious that I, I, I don't know how anyone could not uh, predict that this would be the inevitable result of this increasing intransigence of the people listening to this type of cognitive science. Uh, I, I have said a mouthful there. Is there anything there that you'd like to add to, to what my characterization there? Yeah, and I, I think the, the, demon, the, the dominance of, of, of sort of nominally left-wing ideology in, in, in psychology, psychological sciences, um, I mean, it speaks to a lot of things, but, it, but, 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 but there is, it really is the case that if climate, if psychologists want to study something I think, uh, uh, you know, with, with relation to, to facts and um, ideology and people's uh, uh, comprehension of, of, of science, they should really study climate psychology because it's a it's a it's a basket case. First of all, it needs the intervention of clinical psychologists. It needs it needs people to someone to come and clean it up. It's it's if not just get rid of the whole thing. I mean, it's it it it, it is a it is a nonsense. Um, but but and and you know, I mean, that might that might sound unkind. But I, I remember that the, one of the first encounters I had with, oh, well, I can say a couple of them actually. Uh, the the first uh, encounters I had with with this field. The first was, uh, I think, John Krosnick out of Stanford, which is this, you know, extremely this uh, institution with this worldwide reputation, this fantastic, um, you know, um, university. I'm not sure if it's Ivy League. I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure how it works in the in the states, but uh, nonetheless, right? Um, he, and he said that he, he sort of published this research. This is, I think, 2008, saying that if there was balance on a TV uh, show, a news, a news show. Um, and they, you know, they, they they surveyed hours and hours of footage, and they showed them to hundreds of hundreds of um, participants in studies. If there is balance in a news item on a climate question, then uh, the public are more likely to come out of the other side um, questioning climate change dogma. Who who knew, right? You know, um, uh, and uh, so so um, and and and. Uh, I, what I, what his measure of whether someone was in, uh, gave their assent or dissent to the climate consensus was whether they believe climate change is is happening. You know, like it's kind of an extremely crude understanding of an extremely complicated scientific debate with many moving parts, with many, um, you know, d different different fields within it. You know, you get from climate change, global warming science, through climate change uh, science, through, through, you know, to how these, how these effects um, play out in the natural world and what the consequences are in the human world, through to policy, right? So it's an incredibly complex field. Uh, or, or chain of chain of reasoning, but he distills it to this one kind of um, one kind of thing. So, I mean, someone might see a debate between two experts and go, "Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that 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 climate change might not be happening is is a is a rough approximation of my views on 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 that question, right?" So, so what I'm getting at is that what what John Krosnick and what what his, and 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 what the field in general does not do is examine its own understanding of climate science or the or the climate debate through that whole chain, as I've explained. Right? They don't say what's our understanding, um, and what and, and what can we say about climate science, uh, climate psychology's understanding that we can say the public have misunderstood climate science. You know, it's very, very hand wringing about what the public think, but it hasn't really examined how how it how it is capable of um of set of, of speaking with authority or you know applying that scientific authority to to the climate debate a second one was um the case i think his name is Stephen uh, professor Stephen Moffick 
and, and around the same time, 2007 or, or eight. Um, and he, he wasn't a climate psychologist. He was a, he was a psychiatrist, a clinical psychiatrist. And um, um, he, he wanted to go. There was this article, a little video um, of him um, basically explaining that whereas psychiatry has been founded on the idea of um, uh, uh, trying to relieve the distress that people with mental health problems experience. Um, how could psychiatrists intervene to create a level of distress in people such that they then became obedient to climate environmental imperatives? So it's like kind of this, this like, how can we make people feel so uncomfortable? Um, this is nudge coming to shove, quite frankly, um, that, that they, they go and do as they're told. And that and that's like kind of so so intellectually and morally, uh, people from the cognitive science sciences have have turned everything we know about the Enlightenment, everything we know, even even everything we know about medicine, upside down. You first, do no harm. Now, now you get climate psychologists, uh, cl clinical psychologists, and psychiatrists saying we must go and upset people. Yeah. Um, First, make wow. people scared. <laughs> right. right? And, yeah. and as you point out, there is an actual scientific pedigree to this that people point to, as, you, as you've as you pointed out, the Margaret Klein Salomon mm. paper from 2016 that was specifically latched onto by the Extinction Rebellion crowd in 2018. And which has been the formation of this re 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 rebranding of what used to be known once upon a time as global warming, as the climate emergency, which is yeah. apparently the way they're or they yeah, have they, tried they, to sell it to the public, but I don't think that really yeah. worked. Why well, I remember the first the first climate the first extinction rebellion protests, and and these people really believed like the kind of Trotskyists of the 1970s, that they were going to rouse the masses from their slumber and they were going to march through the streets to Parliament or wherever and, and uh, you know, with millions of people behind them. Um, they're, they're candid about it. You, you can hear them. They talk about precisely this sort of um, idea um, that, that, uh, that they, they were going to... Uh, the, the, one, one of the uh, Extinction Rebellion co-founders, Gail Bradbrook, she, she talks about it openly with MPs. She says her plan was to create the understanding in the public that there were that climate change is not is 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 the equivalent of ten Hitlers, right? Not just one Hitler. And so so this trades on this kind of um, this mythology of the Second World War, where British people come together and we defeat the enemy through our own sort of sheer brilliance never mind the the the, the complexities of the uh, of the second world war requiring the intervention of the united states of america russia and all and the rest of the Anglos and the rest of europe and, and so on and so forth um so so you, you know the, the, this 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 idea of social cohesion can be fabricated through creating this sense of terror um, you know, uh, uh, and, and it's just it's just crap. Anyway, so the first the first protests that they were they thought were going to rouse people from the masses. They had um, uh, grown men with full beards dressed up as. Um, do you have this? You know, the girl guides, the sort of girl scouting movement, girl guide. They were dressed up as you know, in, 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 you know, sort of a bunch of these sort of activists dressed up as, as little girls and other, others, others dressed up, you know, in, in fluorescent gear with the like kind of strange hair and, and, you know, and the, the, none of the, you know, all, all that the masses saw when this protest happened was a bunch of hyper overindulged middle-class people who don't have and can't have jobs who can afford to spend weeks uh, of their time occupying bridges in Westminster and blocking the roads to ambulances, to working people on their way to do their jobs and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so it's the, the most alienating um, expression of, of, of their, you know, like the kind of, you couldn't, you couldn't have engineered a better two fingers uh shown from you know the, the, that class that part of the british british society to to the masses 
To, to my non-British listeners, two fingers might be a, a middle finger, <laughs> the equivalent. Yeah, the, the, right. the bird. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. In fact, I remember the imagery of the Vestal Virgins that they were dressing up at at one of these um, parties that they throwed and, uh, threw through. That was just, I mean, again, yes, this does not connect with the average person. But in a way, it, it's very appropriate because in the same way that the the people who are most hurt by this agenda itself, the actual imposition of the net zero agenda, are the people on the bottom rung of the economic ladder, and the people who are most hurt by the Extinction Rebellion protests and getting people, stopping average working people from going to work and earning a living, are, again, the people at the bottom level of the uh, the economic pyramid. So perhaps that's uh, that's oddly appropriate. Um, but yes. let's let's examine... Let's examine that backlash, because as you have pointed out, and which I think is the, perhaps the positive take on this, um, is that, in fact, this attempt at psychologically manipulating the masses is nothing new. It's something that I've um, pointed to many, many, many times before, so my regular audience will be sick of listening to it, but I'll point to it again. Um, the opening words, the opening paragraph of um, Edward Bernays' classic work on propaganda called Propaganda from 1928. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same. At the, any rate, that's the ambition of these people. But with all of the might, with all of the incredible resources and uh, that have been thrown at this and the, the who knows how many billions and billions of dollars in propagandizing the public that have been spent on not just the climate agenda, but various establishment agendas over yeah. the course of this century of manipulation of the masses. You still don't have the masses buying anything that's coming out of their mouths. And in fact, at an even greater rate than before. Let's talk about the populist uprising that is happening now against the establishment. Well, um, it's it's too soon to call, I would suggest. But it, but but the suggestions are so. Uh, I, I came across a poll yesterday um, that suggests that fifty percent of, of of respondents in Germany. I think it's a it's a fairly reliable institution, and it, um, I, 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 and you'll forgive me if I've forgotten the name, but I can I can post it to you later. Um, this survey of attitudes in, 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 in Europe shows that 50% of people in Germany, for example, um, believe that um, uh, the, the price of energy should be, i.e. lowering the price of energy should be a policy priority over meeting climate change emissions, which is a radical departure from, from the last 20 years of German poli German energy policy. The energy render um, is this, you know, it's this, uh, I think it's it cost the best part of a trillion euros for, for the German economy. And, and of course, now, now partly as a result, a result of um, fallout from the war and of course um, uh, with, with, between Russia and Ukraine and, and because of the uh, lockdowns and, uh, and the uh, energy price crisis, a massive dose of energy realism has been injected into to to uh into germany and this so um this has led to well now no, you know just uh, the 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 german government now consists i think of a from the last general election consists of a large number of uh, uh, greens so, so i think greens have formed part of the government um but but and that's been catastrophic all of this stuff has been catastrophic um, for for um, the, the energy vendor, the, for the climate ag agenda in Germany. And now, now it's created just this backlash that you can see in the polling. It's also sent the farmers um, from, you know, uh, you know, there's a sort of bit of a farmers movement started in the Netherlands, which shows actually similar, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, hostility to the green agenda now. Um, I think it's pretty close to Germany's uh, level of, um, you know, from that from that poll. I think it's about forty-eight percent of people now believe that uh, the government's policy priority should be reducing costs, not not reducing emissions. Um, the, 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 you know, throughout throughout Europe, you, you're getting a lot of these people. Uh, we've had, and of course, in France, we've had the um, yellow yellow vests, the gilets jaunes. Who 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 were and that was that was before that was pre-COVID, um, and they were sparked by changes in um, you know so increasing carbon emissions, putting the price of of fuel up, 
Um, so, so this is this. The, those were these are sort of like the early days. This is the the the, the, the sort of the, the beginnings of the blowback, the reaction to 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 net zero, um, and um, I, I I think and they I mean it's I mean I say it's early days, and they, they've these these haven't really turned yet, or they are they are turning now I believe into organized political movements. So there's the BBB, the farmers movement in in the Netherlands and in Germany, um, and the new uh, alternative for Deutschland, AFD or AFD, I think as you say it in uh, German. Um, they 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 um they are now pushing the sort of um, parts of the. Uh, so social democratic and and uh, soft conservative um, movements into second and third place in in Germany. Now they're sort of occupying twenty percent of the polls or winning twenty percent in the elections and and look like they're, they're they may be rising. And so the German government is having to consider whether they're going to disenfranchise a whole fifth of the of the electorate and abolish this party because it's just it's 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 obviously causing such a, a political earthquake so of course 20% is not enough especially in a in a in a in a country that has proportional representation rather than first past the post um that's never going to be enough to to sort of um change the the policy agenda radically in in short order but it can it can take the momentum out of the the, the mainstream um you know the 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 the, the, uh, the, the, the what, what does remain um as as the sort of consensus between the partners of coalitions and so on so so um and in france that's turning in that's much more decisive because the organized sort of radical right, I suppose you could say, the sort of um, the, the um, Marine Le Pen. She's she, she's been sort of biting on the heels of um, Macron and 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 the and and the uh, uh, other sort of um, mainstream politicians for quite a long uh, for quite a lot longer. Um, you know the the far right. I mean, I, mean, the, the, I think that the the origins of Le Pen's political pro- movement are her father. Um, uh, I've forgotten his name now, so that's not very helpful. Um, I think that, that part of that history can be designated as far right. Quite, you know, it's 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 further right than centre right. Let's put it that way. Um, but she softened her stance, and um, she, you know, she doesn't she doesn't have quite the same preoccupations that the that that movement had in the past. Um, but now it looks like, in, certainly according to polls, that they would they would. Um, be able to form a government um, in the if the if the elections were held today, because people are just fed up with with the establishment um, options that have been given to them in the form of Macron and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, there's in Italy with uh, Meloni has 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 recently some some people um, believe Meloni um, or even you know across the Atlantic in the form of. Um, uh, the, the Argent, new Argentinian pres- president. Um, some people think these these are kind of sort of sellouts, sort of almost establishment sops, sort of put to put into position. But they must, um, they, they 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 it must be quite a tricky job being the president of a country that has a radically different perspective to what the rest of the international community or as it likes to call itself well this, um, this is one of the reasons why i i personally i don't put much stock in the political process itself and the machinations mm-hmm. because it is all part of that establishment machinery that will inevitably be engulfed but what you're pointing to is at the very least all of these political movements are manifestations of a sea change in public opinion general public opinion that would have as you point out with regards to that those those german poll responses that would have been unthinkable even a few years Absolutely. ago let alone a decade yeah. or two ago so that really represents a true change that is taking place that i think is perfectly predictable at the exact point at which the wonderful virtue signaling of oh yes uh, green that sounds good net zero sounds wonderful at the exact moment where that actually starts to impact people's uh, livelihoods yeah. is the point at which they'll start rising up against it and so i think that's a manifestation of what we're seeing but let let me just add one potential devil's advocate question here f- from the other side of this, because we are poo-pooing to a large extent this cognitive science and the uh, the ability of these master manipulators to manipulate the public. But let's take a look at one of the other defining 
ma master manipulative movements of the past few years. Um, specifically, as you'll know about in the UK, the uh, spy B Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Behavior, which was specifically a task force of behavioral scientists that were put tasked with um, actually scaring the public into submission with regards to lockdowns and masking and all of that, which was seems to have been remarkably successful in a large number of people in the public, at least for a couple of years. Maybe they can't maintain that momentum for very long, but they did seem to have a demonstrable effect on people's behaviors, at least in 2020, 2021. So, does that speak to the other side of this, that there are cognitive behavioral scientists that can actually move the needle when it comes to public behavior and perception? There are, I mean, there are, there are hypotheses, um, although, you know, there are an analysis that sort of claim that sort of some of the shocking images and some of the sh shocking stories um, uh, yielded a little bit more um, public obedience than, than, um, but you don't. But the, the point is, you don't need a psychology degree to understand why. If you close off all debate about what kind of problem the pandemic is, and if you and and then if you if you only allow in the media stories about exponential curves of you know depicting deaths, then then people believe that people want to take institutional science. At face value, in good faith, it, and, 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 it, and people want to believe that the scientists, so that the politicians, the government is is acting in good faith, and also that the opposition is acting in good faith. Um, so, I mean, it, it doesn't. It's it's not psychological insight to say uh, um, fear mongering works, right? Um, you know, so uh, I, I I don't know what insights Spy B and Co were really able to bring to that other than just to to justify what the the government had already done to itself like kind of the 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 the, the scaremongering was led by the likes of Neil Ferguson and um you know who produced who produced these models of of infinite exponential growth so that you know this time next year 1500 trillion people would have died <laughs> everyone on the conflict. how many hitlers is that <laughs> tell <Yeah>. us neil <laughs> so 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 that's that's kind of the core and and the psych in in club to just compare it to climate change there's a lot of um what i call consensus enforcement going on in in climate psychology so the you know the, the analogy the analogous situation to the climate debate in in covid is um you know this sort of um these modeling exercises that produce you know radical warming global warming feedback and these sort of scenarios that are based on very implausible um premises of you know everyone burns 20 tons of coal a year and like the population increases from um eight million apes or eight billion people to 12 billion people and 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 you know no improvements in technology are made these are the assumptions and then those get turned into into sort of consequences it's a lot of like uh these they're called self-consistent storylines um in the in the in the scientific literature so these sort of animate people and the psychologists turn up um, to sort of explain why that consensus that this, I put it in quotes if you're not watching um, this consensus position needs to be defended, right? So what they say is um, an accurately informed public is necessary for for proper decision making for democratic decision making to be. Um, advanced, right? To, to go to go ahead. So the pe the public needs to know the right thing, and the right thing are these terrible scenarios. And then so so they're not they're not fueling the debate on its own as such. They're just sort of they're an ancillary to it. They're not they're not they're not the architects of the political agenda. They're just sort of servicing it really, and they're servicing you know the sort of the ideological. Uh, conception of the pro of problems like uh, 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 climate change and, and COVID of, of pandemics, um, 
so, so I mean, how, how <clears throat> I think it would be rash to rule out that that that, that you know that, that they have any impact whatsoever, right? That that, that, that in, in especially in the situation where there's an emergency, right? So you can once you've established fear, right? You know, you, you can you can you can use that to justify this, that, or the other. Um, but as someone said, I wish I knew who. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, right? In reference to Edward Bernays, right? It's not. It's not always a penis, right? So, 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 um, you know, it would be interesting to see uh, where these psychological insights are useful and and uh, or, or effective. Not let's let's not, um, and whether the, and then the, and then there should be a moral deba- a debate. A moral debate about whether they should be applied or not, or like kind of, um, you know, the the the. But but as I say, I don't think many of the insights are very much more powerful than the instance of a fly and a urinal, a picture of a fly and a urinal. Like kind of, it, 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 you know, it, it just, I mean, the pandemic is a frightening enough prospect until you take it to pieces and you examine what the claims are. Right. So, um, I, I mean, a, a perception of a real and present emergency is necessary for this type of manipulation to have an effect. So if people yeah. do not believe in the emergency in the first place, then it is difficult to get them convinced of that. So I, I think what one of the things, one of the corollaries of what you are saying here is that uh, when they shut down debate and they they exclude people from from speaking even um, against this agenda, then obviously they are able to have more effect in shaping the public discourse around it and getting people to comply with the the various diktats. Um, that that seems to me to suggest that as long as people can hear the voice of people like myself, of yourself, of other dissenting voices out there, as long as they exist, then we have a good chance of overcoming this type of manipulation. Um, that would also speak to the fact that, of course, as my audience will know, I, I had my YouTube scan, uh, channel scrubbed during the uh, the dark days of the the pandemic because, well, I dared to speak out against it and to talk about yeah. the lockdowns and masking and all of the other insanity that was going on. So uh, that would explain this headlong rush towards censoring and shutting down of information under the guise of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, all of the new words that they're inventing to try to shut down the public discourse. So us speaking is part of the solution to this problem. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. And I mean, and that's what that's what just seems to 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 wind these psychologists up more than anything else is that we're, you know, what what are what are they trying to defend? And it's and it turns out it's just the political authority of the academy. Of, of of the campus of the of, of the of the university right in in and and they you know it, it's telling that the only way this sort of move the scientific movement has sort of uh conjured up to defend itself is by reference to these emergencies you know like the, the, where the climate change I, I, you, there's uh tony our former prime minister tony blair even has sort of built his sort of legacy um, institution. It's called the, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Challenges. And and it's very much part of this kind of WEF outlook. You know, this uh, I don't go on about the WEF very much. I think they're mostly irrelevant. But but Tony Blair is certainly not irrelevant. But the he, um, he you know, he it presents the future uh, of politics as, as sort of governments finding ways to respond to challenges, which are sort of external to politics, very much to sort of, I think, to deprive ordinary people of, of a role in, in political decision making. So, so you know, once you and once you have kind of established the basis of politics as kind of risk aversion um, of these external, you know, about these external challenges, then you, you don't really the public doesn't really need to be involved. So it's OK. We're taking care. We're mitigating the risks. We're going to save you from pollution. We're going to save you from. Uh, climate change. We're going to save you from viruses and germs, and we're going to save you from Russians, and we're going to save you from uh, yourself, because because you don't even know how to eat properly. Look at you. You're fat. You're unhealthy. Uh, you're you're incapable of managing your own life without being nudged 
through taxation, through behavioural interventions, through this, that, and the other uh, uh, mechanism. So, so um, it's it's very much this this there's uh, the elite, the underexplored aspect of. Uh, elite politics, if you like, I think is is how it's re- reimagined, how it re- reconceived the public, in in order to sort of shore up its own its own position. Um, I may be straying too far from 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 the point or the question, but in in uh, this this sort of this requires uh, organization institu- institutional science to service this view of people not being people's competences not being equal to the demands of these these global challenges um, um you know so so well, uh, uh, yeah. the other one was well, scientists thing. come up with the the wonderful idea that we uh, non-scientists are too stupid to understand this so you have to yeah. leave society up to us and our management yeah. wow what a self-serving idea <laughs> that they've stumbled yeah, upon yeah and, and and then and then climate psychologists that all they all well the whole the whole bloody uh, enterprise, in fact, is there to go and say, yes, we've done a survey of the competences of the of, of ordinary people, and we we found them from them lacking. And um, and then anyone who dares to speak out has to fit into a sort of taxonomy um, of like deniers, uh, motivated reasoners. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, you, you know just bad actors. So this is a much of th- this stuff has uh, this sort of disinformation, pre- this preoccupation with dis- disinformation emerges out of um, psychologists trying to build a taxonomy of of the arguments that people use against this this form of politics and um and and the the sort of the, the implication seems to be that once you've created a taxonomy of your enemies or your critics arguments you don't have to deal with those arguments you say oh yes your moat like like um i don't know if you ever come across these blowhards on the internet who 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 will um involve themselves in discussion only to the extent that they'll they'll say, ah, oh, he, he, here's your here's your argument, and this is logical fallacy, and they'll give the Latin name of the <laughs> of the logical fallacy, and then you'll go, well, actually, I don't I don't see the resemblance of the argument with the logical fallacy, and they're, they're, so they're just sort of making stuff up. It's the same principle. You create a taxonomy, and then you go and give all your little minions the the, the taxonomy, and you say, ah, oh, yes, this argument is a conspiracy theory, and what what turns out like. A lot of these, a lot of these uh, psychologists I've sort of uh, vaguely in, engaged with, uh, they they read any challenge to authority as a conspiracy theory. If you say that your study is motivated by bad faith, that's a conspiracy theory. If you say it's, if you say that the the, the, the scientists involved aren't competent, um, that's a conspiracy theory. Um, and you know, if, if if you say that their methodology is inappropriate, that's a conspiracy theory because everything appears to them as a conspiracy theory because it's a challenge to the authority of the 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 ivory towers. Um, you know, so 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 um, you you don't get very far in these debates with these people because they've got that that's they're they're out, they don't they're, you're a specimen to them, not 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 a peer. The right. pathologization and, and, of dissent. You know what? Right. What particular yeah. cognitive defect do you have? Oh, you're a conspiracy yes, yes. theorist. Yeah, oh. The only reason. I mean, it's like if we, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is where the comparison with Soviet Russia comes in. Is that it? It, it was mad to challenge the authority of the Soviet Union from within um, because. You, you, the consequences would be so grave. So they, so they said, you must be, <laughs> you must be mad to challenge us. Catch twenty two. We're going to really hurt you. Yeah, you know, um, you would be it, crazy it, to challenge it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So and um, and uh, I, I don't. I mean, you know, obviously they're not, they're not rounding people up. They're not shooting people in the back of the head down a dark alleyway, and you know, what have so on and so forth. Well, not yet. Anyway, God knows where it's going to go. Well, but, character assassination seems to do the trick up to this point, doesn't it? And while just when we bring this subject up, I will just direct people once again to this article itself. Please do read it. It it has a lot of very interesting information, including a fact that I probably did know at some point, but which I had forgotten was, as you pointed out, 
Who wrote the book on Nudge back in 2008? Oh, Cass Sunstein, who will be very familiar to my listeners um, with regards to a paper that he wrote around the same time about cognitive infiltration of conspiracy theory groups and how to seed proper information into them to, to get them into disarray so that the government can do whatever it wants, etc., etc. Yes, I forgot about Cass Sunstein's role in all of that, particularly in the idea of nudge. So, Yeah, I, I was I said that um, the... the, the... The the great thing about Cass Sunstein in this debate, I, I was always I was always hoping someone would would put it together um, with with respect to conspiracy theories. Is um, the pub the UK publisher of one of Cass Sunstein's books is based on the ro- is is located on the road I grew up in, <laughs> right? <laughs> Coincidences happen, guys, and um, I, I always wondered whether someone would say, Ah, oh, Ben Paul, he was born <laughs> into in a house. <laughs> uh, we, we, which is the on a road where where the uh, where where Cass Sunstein's books are published. And, um, and that, I was just was about day. to reveal and, that. Oh, God. yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. He's he's caused a lot of trouble, hasn't he? But it's crap. It's crap. It became it became the I say in the article it became the operating manual of the British establishment, right? And it you know became the orthodox. And it was like that. He wrote it, and then the whole. It looks like the whole of the civil service went wow. We can and and um, you know I came I came at this pretty um, the climate debate grew quite green as it were um, I had been a green green but I mean as in green as in um, uh, naive right so I, I thought I, I thought I thought the best of these these the, the academia you know I, I didn't I didn't really really realize the depth to which it had had, had sort of trashed itself and I, I you know I believed good I sort of thought believed in the good faith of of, of, of of science and so on um and 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 then I kept finding involvement between for example we had the um in the government the, they set up a new department in around 2008 called the department for energy for energy and climate change and I'd look at the minutes and who was there. And they'd have all these psycho- psychologists. And, and it took me ages to understand why that would be. And that, the, 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 like, well, why, why would someone who's sort of studying which way rats go around a maze or, you know, what, what, is the, what are the mechanisms of pain and, and so on and so on, why would they be there? Why would they? And, and then, and, uh, and, and it, you know, it, it turns out that they're just propagandists, right? They're just, they're just sort of um, mm, yeah. paper thin, yeah. paper thin sort of uh, yeah. justifications for their being there. It's like yeah. we, we've got to, we've got to get people to behave. Mm. Um, we've got to, we've got to dispense with democracy. And, and yeah, um, the surfeit of, of democracy is our biggest problem, right? Yeah, mm. and, and, and a lot of and, and, and academia had just over the era. Or, or before, for for a long time, perhaps, just or, or large parts of academia had had developed, um, adapted itself merely to service government's agenda. So they're no longer speaking truth to power; they're speaking truth, official truth, for official power. So and and like you know, these are people. Psychologists should be. Attacking governments from academia, academia, they're saying this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing this. But actually, there is seems to be no place. There seems to be no skeptical uh, climate psychologists, uh, or no, uh, well, other than um, Jordan Peterson. There's a great video of him saying the problem is all of the right wing psychologists are in this room sitting in. And, and and that doesn't that very fact alone doesn't trouble climate psychology and it's quite happy to be the service um you know the the just sp- susan mitchy who just happens to be like a maoist or a stalinist she's a, she's a she's a member of the british uh, communist party I, I don't know which sect but but nonetheless they, that 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 that's that says something, I think. You know, it's not it's not a coincidence that psychologists are are are, are quite happy with the idea of governments hiring shrinks to manipulate the masses as, as as though they were some kind of tabula rasa, 
who could be who could be just sort of molded into into whatever shape uh, the, the government needs, um, and and then for that to not raise huge questions in academia, why why aren't academics challenging, and um, and that I argue is how we can know that climate change is BS, whether or not climate change is real, right. Um, this this climate change has created, is is evacuated all of these sort of uh, principles and ethics and uh, establishment ideas um, that that gave us um, respect for those institutions that wanted those institutions to um, uh, uh, be part of um society to make decisions so so i, I that's a tragedy I think it, it really is i will never forget um interviewing the late great dr tim ball at his home in victoria back in 2009 and after a lengthy hours long conversation that we had on the history of science and the philosophy of science and in which he demonstrated his his love of science and his familiarity with the the subject of science and then him lamenting that the worst, one of the worst parts, the a f facets of this perversion of science in the name of this global warming net zero agenda is that it is tarnishing science itself. And yeah. here we are 15 years later. And yes, unfortunately, that's never been more true than it is right now. Uh, ben, we could talk about this for hours, but I think we'll have to draw this conversation to a conclusion at some point. So why not now? But before we go, it, uh, where again? How can people access your work? What's the best place for them to go f find more uh, about these subjects? I'm on Twitter. If you like that stuff, it gets a bit rough and ready, doesn't it? It's, it's like kind of um, digital street fighting these days. And climate resistance, C L M C L I M number eight resistance. Um, I'm at climatedebate.co.uk, and that's our sort of um, attempt to form a response to all of this stuff. Um, sort of, or, 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 and to put debate back at the, it's sort of a bit of a, bit of a campaign, a, a, an attempt to sort of put debate back at the centre of the policy agenda, the climate 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 discussion. Um, and as you say, I'm at net zero. The sorry, the net zero uh, scandal. Dot substack. Uh, dot com. Um, and yeah, that, that's going to be. We've got YouTube videos at various places. Uh, across those sites and um and uh yeah i think i think that's kind of oh it's also about the the daily skeptic of course you'll, you'll see a couple of articles from me there every week hopefully for for the foreseeable future excellent well uh as i say i'll be linking all of that including of course the article that we were focusing on today in the show notes for people who need um those links and i hope this will not be our last conversation ben Pyle, thank you very much for joining us today thanks for having me Bye bye